cartilage is very important. It's, uh, you know, some organisms get by without any bone at all. Sharks are completely composed of, uh, of, of cartilage in terms of their skeleton. Um, and this is a similar basic theme. There's a cell and then there's an extracellular matrix. The chondrocytes are a cell type that uh, lives just like osteoblasts. Uh, and they live in a matrix of proteoglycans, which are these uh, uh, protein sugar uh, uh, structural components of the extracellular matrix. And again, collagen fibrils, different kind of collagen than what bone has. It's got a lot of water, 70% water. Um, in cartilage proper, there are no blood vessels or nerves, but around the periphery there is. And so there's, it's very dependent on diffusion to get nutrients in. So there's, and there are different kinds. There's yellow elastic or uh, fiber cartilage, and that's like what's in your earlobe. And then you've got your sort of load-bearing white uh, fiber cartilage that's in your intervertebral discs. Um, and then finally, you've got articular cartilage that's designed to be very uh, slippery uh, and allow bones to, to rotate on them. And that's called articular cartilage that's uh, on joint surfaces. You've got different kinds. Uh, and they play different roles. Uh, you know, Largely, you know, articular cartilage is designed to minimize friction and wear, um, and it distributes joint load over a wider uh, area. Uh, extremely important, for example, in the knee, very hard-working uh, joint. And it's got very interesting material properties. Um, very strong, uh, uh, or hydrostatic pressure, since it's mostly water, water is not very compressible, uh, and has a, a wide uh, Young's modulus uh, strain, uh, depending on within the, the uh, stress strain relationship that you're residing in. So it operates over a very wide uh, dynamic range. Now it degenerates over time. Um, this is part of normal aging as it, as it, there's use and there's a gradual loss, even independent of use of uh, proteoglycans. The cartilage becomes less uh, effective. Particular or its load bearing role. And osteoarthritis, uh, this is extremely common. It's a degenerative joint disease. It affects more than 80% of people over age 75. It tends to show up in the weight bearing joints, the wear and tear joints. This is, uh, can be confusing. It's different from rheumatoid arthritis, which is an active autoimmune. Uh, process where the immune system is attacking the joints. This is, even though it sounds similar, osteoarthritis is not that. It's a chronic wear and tear condition, but it ends up, it can look at least superficially the same. There's a lot of pain in the joints, uh, difficulty associated with use, uh, treated very differently. In one case, you would give a immune uh, suppressing uh, agent, and in another case, you would not. Um, but extremely common and loss of cartilage being the core issue. So how would you treat that? Well, there are behavioral things you can do. Uh, you can control pain, anti-inflammatories. You can improve uh, you know, strategies for joint use. You identify where the pain's coming from in a patient. Devise for them actions or, or behavioral patterns that allow them to avoid uh, encountering that issue. That can be very effective. Uh, exercise and weight loss helps a lot. Weight loss, reducing the, the loads that the joints are. Um, you know, these anti-inflammatory agents help a little bit, but they have their own risks with chronic use. You can have GI uh, uh, bleeds, kidney failure, and so on associated with Some dietary supplements might help. It's a little less clear. Um, this is an extreme form of a... <laughs> Uh, you know, anti-inflammation, but this, sometimes this is done, corticosteroid injections. This, uh, for people who are over 75 or 80, if they can get a corticosteroid injection, it's like, I've had one friend who I sometimes fish with who says it's like crack for, for old people. They just, they can get a corticosteroid injection. Everything is great for, for a couple of weeks and it really changes their lives. But again, you can't chronically do that. Huge side effects associated with, you know, with chronic corticosteroid use, obesity, psychosis, a whole bunch of other things. Um, and then, of course, there's surgery. So you could come in and say, okay, cartilage is deficient, let's replace the cartilage. Um, or let's take out the parts that are not working well, replace uh, uh, them with something stable, or maybe we can trigger a regrowth of, of uh, cartilage in some way. And 
So there are strategies uh, for that as well. Okay, test. Which of the following are true? I've activated it uh, for osteoarthritis. Primarily affects weight-bearing joints like the knees and hips. Commonly affects women in the age range of 30 to 45. Has an autoimmune pathophysiology where immune cells attack antigens present in the joints. Bed rest is generally advised for all patients with osteoarthritis or all of the above. Great. So I like this question. You guys got it perfect. The distinction being everything else here, these are closely related to rheumatoid arthritis, not osteoarthritis. And of course, uh, activity is, is very helpful. So that's a key distinction. Um, and now let's get on to tendons, ligaments, and uh, joints. So uh, a tendon and a ligament, what's the difference? A ligament is a bone to bone connection. Tendon is a muscle to bone connection. They operate under different constraints, but they're both connective tissues. They're both composed largely of uh, fibroblasts, a key cell type, and then there's uh, water and collagen fibers, again, much like cartilage, it's about 50% water. Um, tendon fibers are, are nearly all oriented along the long axis of the tendon. Ligaments tend to form a more uh, weaving, in, inter, uh, connected or crossed pattern. Um, ligaments, in many cases, are just there to provide additional stability. It's kind of like a mesh or a network, whereas uh, tendons are part of the uh, real active transmission of tensile loads uh, and extremely painting the posture and the form of, of the skeleton. Now, they have their own uh, moduli and, and ultimate strengths. And their behavior is also time dependent. So some of the same things we've talked about for bone uh, relate to tendon. Uh, I won't rehash that, but similar principles. But you can see some of the, uh, the moduli and the ultimate stress relationships uh, indicated there. So they have their own mechanical properties that are important to consider. And then they, of course, uh, fracture or rupture. And this the mechanism is probably similar for ligaments and tendons. Yeah, so creep is um, a process of, uh, it's a little bit like the increased uh, uh, um, accumulation of fatigue. Uh, it's um, the, the fact that the, the, there can be a, a steady increase in the length of a, of a tendon or ligament with uh, repeated um, application of stress. And, and this is actually, um, so it's a lengthening that happens over time. And so you can imagine, again, for, if we go back to the cerebral palsy case, um, you know, where we have the crouch gait and things are, are, are uh, abnormal for that reason, could you take advantage of creep and apply mechanically a very repetitive uh, uh, stress and maybe lengthen uh, a tendon? And that would be preferable to a surgical thing, which might be a little more uh, likely to, uh, to have a, a serious consequences of failure. That's under active exploration. We'd like to understand creep better, you know, which, which biochemical signals enable it, which inhibit it, and, and uh, um, model it better in the laboratory so we can apply it to patients better. Um, so, uh, and again, with, you know, it, it's not all beautiful creeping and lengthening. You, are there also, if you do it wrong, you're going to get micro, you know, failures, micro fractures along the way, and will those accumulate and, and predispose to rupture later, um, and that's something that can be understood as well. Um, and people, are, you know, you can take cadaver knees and, and really you can look at these uh, uh, stress strain ultimate uh, fracture relationships in cadaver knees with, uh, uh, in the laboratory. And you, of course you can do it in animal models uh, as well. Joints, pretty interesting. A lot of uh, very interesting joints in the body. Um, they all use different Many, use many different mechanical principles. Um, we've got some uh, ball and socket joints, like the shoulder and the, and, and, uh, and the hip. Uh, then there's the hinge joints, like the elbow. Uh, there are uh, pivot joints, like the, the base of our skull interacts with our spinal column on basically a pivot joint. And then there are those that are designed for more uh, smooth rotation. Uh, so the wrist joints are, have these uh, this sort of ellipsoidal structure. So everything depends, of course, on the kind of the knee is the most abused uh, joint. Uh, it has a lot of 
pressure on it due to its sort of recently acquired uh, vulnerability and evolution. Um, it's, uh, it bears a lot of weight relative to what it does in other uh, closely related species and exposed. Uh, it's, uh, question, yeah. Um, there's a couple things, and actually the answer is uh, uh, different um, actually for men and women also. So there's a, a few interesting things. The, uh, first of all, actually, uh, there's the angle at which the uh, femurs come down to interact with the joint, and that's a different angle in men and women. That, in, in women, that angle has gotten uh, bigger more recently with evolution uh, associated with increased cradle capacity in childbirth, and you actually have a very uh, different mechanical relationship of the uh, incoming uh, angle of the femur and the tibia, uh, and that's a, a probably the most recent historical development. Going much farther back, though, uh, we actually evolved from uh, organisms that had <clears throat> uh, were pretty low to the ground uh, and had uh, sort of this sort of lizard-like uh, uh, placement of um, the, the limbs, where you've got uh, the uh, forelimb and then the uh, more proximal part of the limb, and you're, you're actually not bearing much weight on the, this uh, particular structure. It's more of a hinge that's designed to link the body to the uh, lower part of the, uh, of the limb that actually is making contact with the ground. And as we evolved upright posture, uh, all of a sudden now, instead of just serving as that sort of connector role, now the full body weight, almost the full body weight is being borne uh, on this, uh, th this knee joint. So it's an upright posture, first of all, we've only got two legs and oftentimes we're on one as we're running and so that's a very unusual thing uh, but also the, the, the full weight being uh, directed toward that joint. So it's upright posture, it's cranial capacity um, and uh, probably other things too. Any other thoughts? But those are, you know, we have much more and then there's the things we do, you know, playing football and so on. That's a pretty recent evolutionary thing. Um, and a lot of what is structured around the, the knee is, is designed though, to pr help provide stability. So we've got these different ligaments, the anterior cruciate ligament, the posterior cruciate, the medial collateral, lateral collateral. Each of these are, pro provide some uh, uh, stability, but they're under immense uh, pressure and then can, can fracture or tear. So what, what creates an ACL tear? Um, not really known. Uh, there's a popular theory that uh, if due to a particular action that's taken, um, the quadriceps pull the tibia forward and the hamstrings are not active and not generating enough balancing force, the joint is going to be deep displaced and the ACL will be stretched uh, and possibly torn. So what kind of movement would create uh, imbalanced um, quadriceps and hamstring action on the joint. You know, uh, it's not really known. There are a few cases where there are, um, we'll also post this movie that didn't get embedded either, but there's an actual movie which we'll put online for you of a, of a ACL injury actually happening. Um, and the frustrating thing is it's not obvious. So you can see this, this woman running and the motion that she took just before the ACL fracture was identical to the motions that she was taking, uh, you know, prior to that moment. Uh, and so it's not as if there was a, a wildly, uh, you know, extreme excursion and it's in, in limb motion or position. Um, and so then you start to have questions, well, was this one of these accumulative things that happened and uh, was it just uh, micro tears that uh, led to susceptibility? Um, and, and we don't really know. Uh, but that will be an interesting thing. We'll, we'll make sure you can. So what do you do then? Well, um, you've got a torn ACL. You can come in and you can sew it back together. You can do that arthroscopically. That's gotten pretty good. Uh, you don't have to do open uh, surgeries. Um, you can also design artificial joints, and that's an active area of bioengineering. Uh, you know, if we can't, if it gets so dysfunctional that you can't repair it, can you uh, design a new kind of joint, and so there's an active sort of cottage industry of, of trying to design uh, new kinds of, of, of knee joints uh, associated with uh, very severe damage. A lot of people who've had chronic and repeated loss of multiple ligaments uh, uh, will end up uh, uh, wanting to think about artificial joints. 
So uh, just to summarize, we've talked about uh, types of, and functions of different tissues in the system. Uh, we've talked about the material properties, uh, we've talked about um, sort of the bioengineering approach to understanding, quantifying, modeling, and, and designing therapies. And there's some supplemental material. I want to save time. So, uh, you know, this is for your own interest. Uh, uh, what in the slides that are after here, you uh, just take a look at them if you're interested. But I want to get right, uh, see if there's any questions, then we'll get right to the, uh, the case study at the end.